So if you're new here, we are glad to have you. AWS is an open virtual Discord community that's focused on helping UXers to learn, connect, and grow their career. We're an inclusive community where everyone related to or interested in UX can join. So I'll be your host today. Uh, my name is Anna, one of the event coordinators at Area UX, and with our amazing moderator today, Kim, who is our event team lead at Area UX. Um, you can direct any questions to her or drop them in the general chat, and she'll make sure they can answer, they get answered during our Q and A section at the end of the workshop. So at Area UX, we hold weekly events. Um, which are virtual meetups like this one, where you can pop in and listen to our guest speakers, share their journeys, their takeaways, and expertise. Um, we also hold portfolio reviews, which are organized by our team to help you receive valuable feedback. Just submit a ticket on Discord, and our senior UX professionals will be able to help you push your portfolio to the next level. We also hold design feedback, coffee chat sessions, design challenges, whiteboard challenges, and mock interviews for you to gain hands-on experience and apply your skills. Um, we're currently also holding interview mockups, which is something new that's on the way. Um, it's a program that's designed to help you prepare, succeed, and excel in your interviews, providing you with experience and insights that will distinguish, distinguish you from the competition. So coming up next, we have another design challenge workshop on Wednesday, September 18th at the same time, 5.30 Pacific time, p.m., and we will have our next design challenge workshop from our mentor team lead, Amy, who will share her expertise on the strategic development and planning of design systems while offering valuable insights draw from real world experience and hope to see you all there. And our third workshop will be held by Taryn on Wednesday, September 25th at 5.30 p.m. PST. He will discuss best practices for effective stakeholder management as well as client relationships. Um, we're a community that's really focused on helping you land your first UX job. If you like what we do at Iter UX, please support us by sending a donation on Ko-Fi to keep our services going. Iter UX is a nonprofit organization, so every donation goes straight into the community and any amount is greatly appreciated. So today's session is, it will be facilitated by Rishi and Wasim. Rishi is a design strategy consultant, and Wasim is a design researcher and a strategist. And today they will be covering applying strategic designs to transform complex wicked problems into actionable solutions, emphasizing the importance of defining project scope and breaking down systematic issues, learning to tackle systematic challenges through high impact quick win solutions, as well as engaging in interactive exercises to enhance your design skills and make a tangible impact on your projects. So before we begin, just some housekeeping rules. Please keep your mic muted during the presentation unless you would like to share something. And please leave your questions in the chat box and we'll make sure Rishi and Wasmi answer them during the Q&A session. And join our Discord community if you haven't already yet. And lastly, our live sessions will be recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. And most importantly, be kind and have fun. And now let's give our warmest welcome to our speakers for today, Rishi and Wasim. Um, Rishi and Wasim, I will let you guys take over. Well, hello. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, and can you all see my screen? Thumbs up would be appreciated. It's lovely to have all of you all here. Um, firstly, it is a Friday evening. I'm in Pittsburgh. Wasim is in New York City. So we appreciate you taking time out from your evening, uh, early afternoon, early in the morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, we welcome you to this. Uh, it's really exciting um, that you guys are part of this challenge. And um, it's always helpful to have a community like this. So thank you to Iterate UX to, you know, facilitate this and invite us to share some things that we've learned on the way um, as collaborators and designers um, about designing for complexity and uh, how we navigate systemic challenges with design thinking. So I'll give you a quick overview of um, the run of program for today. Um, we'll have a brief introductory section where we really talk about what complexity is and how we define it and get into the nitty gritty of what designers commonly call wicked problems. 
and then also make sense of design thinking and how applied design thinking um, can potentially help make sense of uh, the wicked world that we live in and also look at some uh, interesting frameworks within the design thinking realm um, that have been particularly effective for us while we develop projects. And in the second section, we look at um, design thinking and action, wherein we go through a case study that we worked on um, for a company um, and really look at all of the elements of the tools that we use through the process so that you're not just getting information, but you're also seeing the development of a project um, that we were part of. And at the end of that, in fact, in the middle of that, we have a little fun ideation exercise that you'll be part of because as designers, undeniably uh, creating is something that we all love doing. So we'll uh, dive into that a little bit. Although a lot of what we're trying to do today is focus really on the research aspect and how you kind of make sense of the problem you're dealing with. And to conclude, we give you a little bit of tips and tricks that you can apply to your project and also develop the right mindset as a designer when you're applying design thinking. So with that, I'll start off. Um, we live in a world that's riddled in complexity. Um, obviously, we're a generation that's lived through one of the biggest sort of recent events like the pandemic. We're living through sort of adversities when it comes to climate, poverty is around us. So it's always interesting to see that how we as designers have been told that we have the agency to affect change when it comes to these VUCA challenges, right? There's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it was Richard Buchanan um, and Horst Riddle back um, in the 70s who came up with this term, wicked problem, uh, where it's characterized particularly by its sort of undefined nature, its interconnectedness to this network of challenges and issues, and it not having a single solution that can fix it. Because the thing is, coming up with a solution for a thing that's in this vast flux of an issue is often uh, symptomatic and it's not something that we as strategic designers or experienced designers want to go with. Um, and this wickedness is also unique in nature. There's always, it's constantly evolving and there's a array of stakeholders involved purely because of the network that they're connected in. And um, we now look at how potentially is there a solution to wicked problems or complex problems? Um, the answer isn't simple. It's not easy to say that, oh, here's a wicked problem. Uh, let's, let's take a look at an example that we have here. How do we help people allow, age alongside rapidly advancing technology? Now that's the ex example that we run with throughout this um, presentation. Uh, but the challenge here is there isn't one solution, right? Solutions to wicked problems often lead to unintended consequences purely because these problems are ever evolving and they require adaptive strategies that keep up with the, the issue itself. And it's not a band-aid solution that we're looking for. So it's really important when you're approaching systemic challenges like this to think about the system that the problem exists in, right? Um, the environments and the larger context within which every problem exists, what are the stakeholders involved? What are the motivations and the issues that are causing? What is the root cause of the issue? Um, really expanding that view and not just looking at, okay, why aren't people filling a form, right? If you're looking at an insurance thing, for example, it's always much bigger than that. There's tendencies and emotions attached to it, which then also reflect on cultures, uh, which then also affect on larger systemic issues. So it's really important to uncover what these systemic challenges are when you approach a problem. Uh, this is a quote that we really like. Uh, Tanya Nezi is the founder of Betna Design, and she speaks about liberatory design, which is really interesting. Um, but this quote really resonated with us while we were developing and learning um, at Parsons, which is without a deep, uh, deep self and systems awareness, we often reproduce the same systems of oppression regardless of our intent. So as designers who are trying to solve challenges thrown at us, some big, some small, it's always important to have awareness of systems and also awareness of yourselves. As designers and as creators, we have our own biases that often cloud our judgment, especially when it comes to our discovery. We often seek confirmation on things that we feel would be the right answer. Um, we often have a solution mindset. So it's very important to address and identify these biases early on and also understand the biases of the system that you're playing within uh, while you're developing a project. So moving to framing. Now, when you're thrown a challenge, 
the way the problem is framed is almost entirely the base of the issue, right? You might have a vague idea of what the problem is. And again, it's riddled in complexity, but it's really important to define the realm within which you're working and find your in into that problem and not go as, oh, I'm going to solve for climate change, right? You need to have the ability to look at the at the vastness of the issue, map that out, find strategic points of intervention. It can be a consumer side, it can be an enterprise solution, whatever it is, find that thing so that you're not riddled uh, with a scope that you can't manage uh, and you're not burdening your team with the capabilities that they might not have. So it's really important to frame your issue um, and frame the problem appropriately. So now we move into a little bit about design thinking. And this is thrown around a lot. It's existed from before, believe it or not, IDEO popularized it. Um, and it's really changed and metamorphosized over time. Uh, what we've seen is this sort of standard five-step empathize, define, ideate, prototype. I'm not even gonna like get into it. I mean, we're all designers here. We've all seen this. Uh, we all know the steps that go into design thinking, as they say. Um, it being non-linear is something that they keep stressing on. It's not It's not as straight as you see it. Um, like I said, you need to find your vantage point. You need to find your entry point. Sometimes you might be working with a solution, right? A solution that might have its challenges, but then you're working back into understanding, okay, here's a solution. Why is this not working? Go back to empathize. Maybe sometimes you're testing something, but you need to redefine your problem itself. So it's always kind of moving back and forth between these steps. Um, and it's important to be adaptive and think and stay on your feet. But without spending too much time on this, um, we move into a framework that has been especially uh, effective for us. Um, it was introduced by the Design Council um, and it's called the Double Diamond. Simply put, it's um, these two squares that you see, um, the two diamonds that you see are divided into two phases. The first diamond that you see is the problem phase and the second is the solution phase. Now in each section, uh, you see there's discover, define, develop, deliver. Again, it's four steps. But what's interesting here is this framework is one of them that actually stresses on the fact of diverging and converging, which is truly important when it comes to solving systemic challenges. Um, when you look at it in a little more detail, you see that when it comes to the problem that you have at hand, right, that brief that you get that, hey, okay, um, uh, how do we help um, aging populations grow uh, with um, the company that we speak about? So you have your first phase, which is a discover phase, which is where you truly kind of go wide, uh, cast a broad net, leave no stone unturned, and really look into what the possible issues could be. You have the different tools at your disposal uh, when it comes to research, primary and secondary. Use that to kind of make sense of the issues. And when you reach that apex that you see here is when you've reached a point where, okay, I've collected enough material, now it's time to kind of narrow, narrow down. So you start converging towards defining what the problem is, right? So all of that data that you've collected so far, you start visualizing that. You start seeing patterns. You start identifying potential points that you could fix. You start really crystallizing that what the problem is. And you move into that center there, which is called the define phase. And that's a section where you have that vague brief of what the issue exists in. And then at definition is where you have clarity on, okay, hey, that's what they said, but here's the real truth. Here's the thing that we need to fix. And this might not fix that problem, but at least moves the needle in the right direction. And as designers, it's really important to know that you were often called problem solvers, but more often than not, we're only pushing and taking the, a step forward in the right direction. And that itself is a great deal when it comes to dealing with complexity. A step forward is a big step. So um, moving from there, from definition, again, the, the diamond widens up. You get into development. Here's the fun part. Here's the part that everyone kind of itches to do. As designers, you think of creation, you think of building new things, you think of innovating. Um, again, the develop also has a really, uh, it, it, it diverges out uh, into an extreme where you have um, ideation sessions, brainstorming, crazy aids, right? Where you really kind of, within the realm of what your definition is, you're exploring possibilities without really constraining yourself. Um, and again, once you hit that apex, you've got to learn, okay, we've done enough of our brainstorming. There's been some beautiful ideas. 
you put that through a prioritization metrics and you start reeling it back in. And that's where you reach the deliver phase where the crux of design thinking, what they speak about is finding the sweet spot between a product, its viability, and also its feasibility. Uh, and feasibility being, do you have the technical or the resources to execute a project like this? Is it within the scope of what you can do? And when it comes to uh, viability, you're thinking of how does this now fall into the business context of things? And it's really important to think beyond just as, oh, I'm creating a product, but where does that product fit in? Are you creating a product for an existing company? Are you building something from scratch? Either or, where does it fit in to the world that we live in, right? Because you need to understand that your problem isn't, like I said, a solution. Your problem, I mean, your solution isn't a solution. Your solution is a new problem that you're introducing into this flux, right? Uh, there's always going to be challenges that come with it. So think of that. Think of where you want to situate this new solution slash problem of yours. Where do you want to put that in and envision that? So with that, we move into looking at a case study um, that we're pretty proud of. Vaseem um, has done some immense work on this. And we look at this double diamond action in action and we take you through that. So I'll pass it over to Vaseem now. Awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. Good morning to those who are in a very different time zone. I'm Vaseem and uh, Rishi, thank you for that primer. I hope I'm audible and clear to everyone. Um, I know there's been a lot to digest in the past like few minutes. Um, but remember, we're, we're right now speaking about the double diamond in action. And I'm going to take you through a case study of how we worked with, with a very wicked problem and use the double diamond to like solve it. Or not solve it, but like get, you know, like she said, one step closer to a solution. So the challenge that we're going to talk about today, and this is akin to like what you must be doing with with your event um, with iTrade UX, which is a wonderful organization, you have a challenge and you're going to have to solve it um, with UX design principles, design thinking, et cetera. So we're talking today about this um, sort of high level challenge. How might A to Z help its customers age alongside technology? Now, A to Z, uh, you can imagine it as a fictional um, technology and e-commerce giant. And it services millions of customers worldwide. Um, they're trying to build and future proof their company. And so they're looking for a strategy um, that will solve or like that'll answer this question, right? Just think about it. Take a step back. You're a big company and you want to future proof it. So you come to a design strategist, you come to an event like this and you ask the question, how might we A to Z help our customers age alongside technology? Think about this question itself. If you look at it, it has all the elements of a wicked problem, right? What does aging even mean? It sounds very ambiguous, right? Um, what does it mean to age alongside technology? If you think about that, it sounds quite complex. Now you're talking about the human technology sort of relationship. So considering like the complexity of this challenge, um, it's clear that it is a wicked problem. Um, and I'm gonna take you through how we approached solving this. Um, Rishi, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the first stage of solving such a challenge is discovering the problem itself, right? You want to really uncover the root problem. And this also represents the first stage of the double diamond where you're like going really wide. You're exploring the problem space through research, analysis, you're finding insights, and then you're defining and you're creating criteria to box this problem in some way. Um, and how do you do that? Next slide, please, Rishi. Something that's really useful to do when approaching such a complex challenge um, and to make sense of the problem space itself is to follow this process. The first step is to visualize the brief. Take that sort of sentence and break it down and visualize it. What does aging mean? What is technology? Who is this A to Z? Right? Visualize the brief, like just break it down, spread it out. And the next thing that you want to do is identify some research objectives. You need to know what you're going to like search for, what you must find, right? So you need research objectives and research questions. And then you go on to the field and you start conducting the research. And lastly, you analyze the insights. It's a very straightforward process. And I'll show you how it's done in, in, in this case study that we're talking about. So the first step of visualizing the brief, 
like I said, um, take that brief and just spread it out. Take the keywords, open it out. If you use Mural or Miro, these are really useful tools to, to, use, to create sticky notes and like to map out ideas. This is what it would look like um, if you did that exercise. You know, you can see how these bubbles are like really spreading out wide. And that really helps you give, a, give an idea of where do we stand, where do we position ourselves? Um, and, and for us, with, with respect to this problem, we discovered metaphorically that, and literally that age is not just a number and ability is actually a spectrum. When you say I'm old, um, it doesn't just relate to a number. It also speaks to an ability, right? As you grow older, your abilities also change. Your needs change, right? So now we're thinking about age from an ability perspective. Could it be possible that as you grow older, you actually become disabled in some way? Does the technology that you need as you grow older look different from the technology that you use today? So what does aging look like from the standpoint of your relationship with technology and your relationship with the world around you, as opposed to it just being a number and as opposed to it just being something that changes visually, right? So visualizing the brief helped us get to this really interesting sort of idea that age is not a number and ability is a spectrum, which led us then to following the path of accessibility. Okay, um, so again, once you visualize the brief, what's important is to start asking questions. Who is involved in this um, aging? What, what technology do they use? Why do they use such technology? Where do they use it? And when do they use it, right? Create a list of questions. As you can see on the right, there's a list of questions. I just took some screenshots from our project, but it can be many questions. What you must then do is try to like, you know, um, consolidate your questions and ask the really important ones. And that takes me to the next step, which is to start finding answers to those questions. How do you do that? Desk research. You sit on your system, your, your, your laptop, your desktop, whatever it is, you search for articles, you look for journals, um, you search on social media, um, you conduct market analysis. So you do a lot of research just from your system um, using online libraries, or you can go to your local library and just find answers to some of those questions. Um, next step, Rishi. But, you know, oftentimes those answers are not always available on the internet, right? You need to actually go out and ask people. You need to find out who are the important players in this system that, uh, that this problem really affects. And that's where a stakeholder map comes in. You need to really know, you need to get a deep understanding of who are the users, who are the stakeholders, who are the, the customers who this problem really affects. And one way of doing that is by using um, an interest versus power sort of like uh, matrix where you map out who are the people that are most interested in this project or in this problem space versus who has the most power when it comes to changing things within this ecosystem. So creating this map sort of helps you identify where are like, who are the people that you want to speak to? And, um, and that moves takes, takes us to the next step which is reaching out to these people, right? At the end of the day, like I said, you can't find all your answers online. You need to actually go out there. You need to get out of the building and you need, you need to go ask people. And I think this is the, the single most important step that I would recommend while you're working on your iTrade UX project, which is to get out of the building and just go and speak to people. It could be anybody. For this project, we literally spoke to people on the road. That's a process called guerrilla interviewing. But essentially, stakeholder outreach is conducting interviews, um, you know, and these could be semi-structured, these could be structured, or these could be like, um, you know, unstructured, right? So just go out there, ask people, gather insights, find out what's happening, what the real experience is, right? And then that leads you to a more human-centered solution or understanding the problem from a hu more human-centered space. Um, something to just keep in mind, um, Rishi, if you don't mind just going back, is before you get into interviews, you must have an interview guide. You must know what questions you're gonna ask. And after the interview, you need to follow a process called coding, which is where you like gather your interview uh, insights and cluster them. As you can see on the right, there's blue stickies and there's yellow stickies. So this is a way to like cluster and categorize your insights because there's a lot of things people are gonna say. And by categorizing, you're gonna find out what's important and what's not. Next slide, please. 
once you know who are the people involved, you must also understand how they interact within an ecosystem, right? You must understand what their relationships are with each other within the system. And that's where an ecosystem map comes in. And this is a really useful tool to understand where you want to play, right? With A to Z, it is a marketplace. It is a technology company and they have a lot of products. So how do we know which are the ones that really matter to the stakeholders that we want to solve for? And by, by creating an ecosystem map, it really helps to like identify those leverage points like Rishi discussed, right? So as you can see, there's, there's something that's really close to the center and there are players and there are ecosystems and there's, you know, things around on the outside. That shows you what's more important and what's le le less important. But at the same time, all of them work together. They're interconnected. Okay, so this is a good way to like map out things um, and a good way to make sense of what's going on in the system. Um, now, once you have all these different artifacts, you've done the stakeholder map, you've done the interviews, you've conducted the desk research, and you have your ecosystem map, the next step, which is the most challenging, is finding patterns. And this is essentially you sitting and looking at everything that you've discovered, everything that you've collected. Just put it on a mural board, put it on stickies, on a board in your house, put it on a white board, and just look at it. And you need to start finding patterns. Where can we like make a difference? Who are the people that we want to focus on? What do they need? Um, what do we discover that's really in interesting and that's untapped, right? So you start finding patterns and it's done using a process called affinity mapping. It's a really useful process where you start clustering things that are similar, right? You find things that have affinity to each other, okay? So affinity mapping is just bringing your ideas together and finding connections between them. What we discovered is, um, is some of these insights that as people age, it is likely that they will have some sort of a mobility related disability. So you can see how we went from aging alongside technology to suddenly age being about disability, right? And, and that's interesting because, because eventually when we age, we're gonna somehow be disabled. So if we focus on people who are disabled today and if we solve for them, then, then isn't it possible to like future cast and create a solution that works in the future? So, so these are some like ideas, if you can wrap your head around it. Um, for us, it was really impactful because it helped us narrow things down. We went from aging to people with disability, right? Um, and what something else that we discovered is that people with disabilities, specifically mobility related issues, they face a lot of barriers to accessing wheelchairs, right? And and that's a big problem because having a wheelchair really impacts your health and well-being. Having a wheelchair really differentiates whether you are part of society or whether you're not. So now we found like a really important challenge within that aging with technology spectrum that relates to an underused, underutilized audience, uh, sorry, an under, underserved audience of people with mobility issues. And, and A to Z being a marketplace, they sell wheelchairs. And so how do we, what are the barriers that people might face within this marketplace? And, and how do we make this marketplace a lot better to serve such consumers so that in the future, you know, as we age, we're, we're better um, taken care of. So as you can see now, we're starting to like slowly narrow things down. We're narrowing things down. We went from aging with technology um, to now something that's a lot more narrow. Um, and this is where you start defining things, right? You start defining your problem space. You start crystallizing your problem. You go from something that's extremely complex and like up in the air to something that's narrow. And this is this is something that I urge you all to like try and focus on, which is to like take a big problem and start chiseling it and, and coming to like something that's a lot more essential, something that actually can be addressed, a small quanta of a problem. And for us in, in this case, it's it's this. This is the problem statement that we developed. Who do we want to focus on? Individuals in the need in need of wheelchairs, who are affected by affordability, service, and supply barriers. What are we trying to do? We're trying to enhance the wheelchair purchasing experience through A to Z's platform. 
Why? Because there is a big accessibility gap. In fact, there's only 15% of people in the world that need wheelchairs who actually have access to them. And where are we going to do this? On A to Z's e-commerce platform. How are we going to do this? By improving the service delivery, optimizing user interface, and addressing key challenges like awareness and supply chain efficiency. So as you can see, we've gone from a broad, like I'm again highlighting this, we've gone from something really broad, like a wicked challenge. How do we help A to Z customers age alongside technology to now being focused on wheelchair experience, shopping experience, right? And only now have we started this whole process of developing personas. Usually in traditional like UX um, and design thinking methods, we talk about personas very early, right? But when you're talking about a wicked problem, you want to first chisel down the wicked problem to something that's solvable. That's something that has a, a well-defined user um, or an audience. And then we develop the personas because we want to design for real people at the end of the day. So we go from systems to now individual and human centered. So these are some of the personas that we decided, uh, defined. Now personas can be very like detailed or they can be very simple. And this is what worked for us, keeping really simple personas. Okay, um, next slide, please. Here's another really useful tool, which you're gonna definitely use, which is journey mapping. Now what we did, we took the persona and we asked them what their wheelchair shopping experience on A to Z was, right? And and we used something called a journey map to basically map that experience out, experience out. You take the different stages of the buying experience from awareness to exit and ad advocacy. What were the different things they did and how did they feel? So you can see a, a bit of a graph that forms. Like at the start of the um, buying experience, they, they, they really found it hard to find the right platform and the right wheelchair. And the research was really hard. Making a decision was also difficult. So we started like noticing a lot of pain points in this in the shopping experience through the journey map. Um, and that's what you need to do here. You need to start identifying pain points, which then leads to the next thing, which is generating how might we statements or opportunity statements, right? Um, so in that journey map, you have an observation. Um, and an example of that was that people with mobility issues often don't consider A to Z as their primary choice while shopping for wheelchairs. So that is an observation. The insight that we discovered is that wheelchairs are often like custom made and uh, they need to be like fitted so that it, 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 it provides an environment for like health and well-being. Um, but unfortunately, A to Z doesn't have those features that allow you to custom build a custom search for your the wheelchair that works for you, right? So our opportunity statement here was, how might we improve the wheelchair shopping experience on A to Z to incorporate the custom needs of buyers? So you can see, we've gone from something that's really broad to then something that's a little narrow to, to finally something that's much more um, manageable in terms of how large a problem it is. Right now, it's become a UX problem, um, and so this is where now we're gonna like move into the fun part, which is ideating on solving a problem. And I'll hand it over to Rishi um, to take us through that. But yeah, I hope you know if there's one thing that I would like you all to take away from this so far, um, apart from the tools, obviously, which you can you can you can go through the video later and and figure out. But remember, we've gone from something broad to something narrow, and only then can you actually solve a real problem as opposed to solving a, a symptomatic problem. Okay. Um, Rishi, you can take it over from sure. here. Thanks so much, Vaseem. Um, I want to add to what Vaseem said that obviously um, this, like taking you through this project and showing you some of the tools that we used to develop it, this is specific to this project. Obviously, there's so many other tools out there. There's so many other things that you can use to make sense of the data that you that you uh, uh, accumulate. There's a lot of way to visualize some of the content that you have. Um, these are some of the things that work for us. Uh, we implore you to like try these out for your projects individually, but also like look at the other things that work for your projects. So none of what we're saying is meant to be prescriptive. Um, these are all sort of, uh, like I said, design is something that everyone has their own way to go about it. 
this specific framework of the double diamond is something that we found was specifically very, very useful for us. Um, so I just want to like point that out there as we move to the next stage and the next diamond, which is part of the solution phase, uh, which is the development phase. Now, um, this is something that I'm sure as designers, we're all sort of well, well versed with. You again, start, start wild and crazy, start your brainstorming processes, do your crazy eights. And again, it's informed by that defined problem statement that you have, but at the same time, you're trying to not have the weight of, um, feasibility and viability yet, right? You want to start with something that's okay. Here's a problem. How can we solve it? Like, let's not think of constraints yet but also cast a wide net. So which is why this pro this second section of the diamond does go wide for a bit because you're not operating within these constraints. Um, now for this, again, there's many tools, there's a crazy eight, there's brainstorming, there's rapid prototyping, things like that. But what you're trying to do here is quick and dirty ideas that solve the issue, right? And what you're trying to do from that is there might be some, some Ideas might be impractical and crazy, but at the same time, never discredit an idea in this phase. It's very important to do that. You need to harness um, an environment of collaboration and freedom to think freely, uh, to ideate openly um, and like courageously, I might add, uh, just so that you can, you're can you not operating within too many constraints. And then when, again, once you reach that apex is when you start to reel it back in and then you add your con constraints and your dependencies and bring it back to a real solution. So with this, I'm gonna take a quick quick sort of pause here and um, give y'all a chance. Now you, y'all have been following uh, the project with us so far. Um, so we're gonna try an exercise, which is a rapid ideation exercise, which is called the crazy eight. Uh, and this sort of stresses on the fact that the solution doesn't have to be strictly um, sort of like implementable. It can be a crazy idea. Uh, and you can sketch it out. So take a little page, make an eight by a, eight by two sort of box. I mean, four by two box, my bad math is all over the place. <laughs> but yeah, just do, just make a little eight boxes. And um, in eight minutes, try to sketch out eight ideas uh, with the prompt of how might we improve the wheelchair shopping experience on A to Z to incorporate customer buyer needs. Um, so give it a shot. Um, Sketch it out, and for those who are comfortable sharing, just put it up on the screen at the end of um the eight minutes, and we'd love to see what you guys are doing. Was he? Were you saying something? Yeah, sorry, I was uh, saying we, we can set timers, and um, yes, um, we can set those. Uh, sort of. Yeah, we can give everybody the signal. You help us with that, uh, Anna. Do you have? I can do it on my phone, but. I think on the phone is fine. We can do it here. Yeah. Um. So essentially, yeah, everybody's got to like sketch eight ideas in eight minutes, which means you're going to have to sketch one idea per minute. Mm -hmm. right? um, and we'll give you a, a couple of minutes to like pick up your notebook and just draw like eight boxes, as you can see here. I'm not sure if you can see my screen um, or like my, my notebook, but just draw eight boxes. Pretty simple. Um, and within these boxes, you're going to sketch some ideas. And it could be like text. It could be pictures. It could be anything crazy, like like Rishi said. Um, but yeah, eight ideas in eight minutes. Um, and we'll set timers and we'll see what I'm comes out. Right now, all right. Um is everybody like ready and all yeah, is everyone with us? If you could just push post a thumbs up. I see a lot of y'all are camera off, so a thumbs up would help so we know you're with us. And if you're I'm not, you can put a thumbs one. down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I see one thumbs up. So I guess Ruthika is with us. She's going to do it. Wincy, Does Masu. anybody need more time? Yes, please. Let us know. Help us help you. All right, I'm going to start the timer. And again, at the end of the timer, we would love for you all to come and share some of the ideas that you have if you feel comfortable with it. Um, if not, we'll proceed with the project itself. So the time starts now. In the meantime, if you'll have any questions, Anna, if any questions in the chat, we can address some of those too. Sure. Mm -hmm. So one minute is very short when it comes to like ideating. So you, you better. <laughs> yeah.
there was a lot of silence um uh, it would be fun if you could hear each other thinking uh but it's all right yeah. can't stand <laughs> but see we should try it out anna anna and uh kim you, you guys should please participate <laughs> sketch out your ideas let's see I'm yeah sketching. here you go awesome to have some background music playing for this segment but it's it's totally cool Rishi are we down with a minute we're at two minutes um yeah, you'll have every time every time we get get to the end of a minute, get a yeah, okay. Minute. Okay, let's go to idea number three, everyone. <laughs> Jump to <laughs> idea number three, everyone. All right, we are at three minutes, so on to idea number four. Also, Kim, do we have a, a view of where everyone's from? Uh, it also, is everyone a participant? for the challenges? We don't yet, but if we are able to multitask, then <laughs> drop it in the chat where you're from. And... No, no, no. Focus, ideation. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we can we can figure that out later on uh, yeah. after the activity is done. <laughs> but if you want to challenge yourself. <laughs> <laughs> We're another minute down, last three ideas, go get them all, last four, I lost track. <laughs> so, last four, yeah. We have a special uh, prize for um, the best uh, graphic artist in today's participation. So let's see those paintings, let's see those artworks, whatever, let's see those beautiful words, whatever you can come up with. Again, remember, it's about going wide, going crazy. There's a reason it's called the Crazy Eight. So really have fun with it. If your solution is fix their need for a wheelchair, I will accept that. <laughs> All right, we're down last two minutes.
feel like most people could have given up by now, but no, I have I have I have faith in this cohort. Let's see. Also for those when when it comes to sharing, um if you're not comfortable coming on camera, just feel free to type some of your ideas in the chat box. So, you know, we just um get the interactive element going and really share ideas based on what you've seen so far. Last minute, y'all. Let's do it. Okay, let's go. Final stretch. Get those creative juices flowing. <laughs> So hi, Masood. Good to know where you're from. Oh man, Australia. Yeah, bright and early. The good morning was for for him. Especially. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> All right, twenty more. Let's go. Twenty seconds. Last 10, 8, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. All right. Awesome. Um, so, yes, you all know the drill. Anyone who wants to come, show us your sketch on camera, drop your solutions in the chat, whatever. I see Anna's grinning pretty wide. I think she's got some crazy stuff going on. Let's see it. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but... I saw you very intently ideating, so we would love to see some 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 ideas. Um, yeah, I guess I only have like four ideas now. Right. Like, I'm gonna show. I don't know if you can see, but yeah, I'm just gonna describe it because my drawing is not so it. good. Go for it. Um, one of my ideas was have more like an AR experience, which has to be like mobile friendly, so we can like use the phone to visualize the product in the physical space mm -hmm. to better suit our customers' needs. Mm -hmm. um, just to see it in like a real vision, sort of. Mm -hmm. And the other one was like a live agent, mm -hmm. which I believe it's already incorporated in a lot of e-commerce platforms. Mm -hmm. But it's more like having someone um, real time to help solve any problems or questions or inquiries that our customers might have. Right on. Um, and the other one was more like a user guide mm -hmm. of um, of the details and the specific instructions of our products. Mm -hmm. More, uh, it's I was think I was having I was thinking like the Lego menus in mind. I don't know why, but more like the incorporating text with um, imageries mm -hmm. and. Or like the IKEA instruction manuals, I don't know. More like those interactive right. instructions to really help our buyers to visualize it in mm -hmm. at least on paper or like digital. Got it. Form. Yeah. That's, but that's yeah, awesome. that's all these that's are great going. ideas. Yes, uh, Wasim um, <laughs> should should have gone with your idea. <laughs> these are great. These are, yeah. These no. are um, anyone ones. else in the chat? Uh, let us know. Do we have any ideas popping? Did anyone got their eye on the um, chat? I don't mind sharing. Oh yeah, go for it. So who is who are we hearing from? Oh, I'm Ritika, oh, by Ritika. the way. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Hey. So I'll just show this for like a quick second. I think it's uh, your out, I think so... your thing is on background blur. So we Yeah. Can't... So I'll just voice it out. Or, yeah. Um so I'll just run through them. One was like an at-home service where someone comes over to your house and it's like a tailor where they kind of measure you so that you know. I don't know what customization is going to a wheelchair personally. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, okay, someone comes over. So you yourself don't have to go anywhere or mm -hmm. do something. So it's like an at-home service. Uh, a second one was, you know, where you put in your measurements or something yourself into the app. And then based on that, Amazon, I mean, A to Z would kind of recommend you, you know, base and you kind of like pick your part. So it's not it, just you buy the whole wheelchair. It's like you pick parts. Mm -hmm. So you can be like, okay, this part with that part. And then you can kind of build your own. Uh, my third idea was just you make it and you 3D print it. Mm -hmm. My fourth idea was, I guess it goes with the third one, where you 3D model it and then you send it to someone or you talk to someone who's a 3D modeler 
you get your stuff and then they make it for you and send it over. Very cool. My yeah. fifth idea was like a VR experience, mm -hmm. you know, which is, I think, a little bit similar to what Anne had where mm -hmm. you're not actually meeting, but it's like through some VR, AR thing where you talk to like a person and then you can try out uh, wheelchairs and be like, okay, this is what I want to change, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my sixth idea is like a A to Z warehouse where you just kind of go and there's all the parts and you, mm -hmm. you can kind of try it out all at once and they'll put it together, try it out, don't like it, switch something out. Right. Uh, my seventh idea was just having not, it's not about A to Z, but it's just having a wheelchair that's like adjustable with thing where you can change stuff, change wow. stuff and measurements. And eighth one, I was kind of burnt out. So I just did like an online team appointment where you talk to someone. That works, but you made it to eight. That's very cool. Amazing. Well done, Jessica. Well done. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, no, this is this is awesome. Um, Vaseen is excited because a lot of these ideas were, in fact, things that we uh, did eventually sort of uh, get into. So it's good. It's good to see that. You see like there's, there's overlaps here, especially when you're doing a team sort of brainstorming session like this and things like this, you might feel like your idea is impractical, but you might see overlaps with someone else's idea, which is similar to yours, but has does something better. So there's mm -hmm. always room for you to pick and choose when it comes to this sort of free willing brainstorming or crazy eight or whatever you want to do. Um, but at the same time, then use these sessions to kind of reel it back in and um, move into the kind of defining it within the constraints. Thank you so much, Ritika. Appreciate it. Um, so we'll move on now. Um, obviously, we're aware of prototyping. A lot of people think of, um, you know, UX as screens and digital and all that stuff. Um, but it doesn't have to be, right? When it comes to prototyping, there's an urge to move into building. Um, building and prototyping, like, shouldn't be used synonymously because we look at building as, like, the solution itself. Prototyping is what you do to, like, a quick and dirty version of what your solution would be like, right? So as minimal effort, as long as it does the job of, um, like functionally does the job, right? Even if it's sketching on paper, if you're starting like trying to, if one of your solutions is a business model then try those things out, try elements of that business model. Uh, if you're trying a thrift store, right? Take three clothes, go to a place, act out that sort of scenario with people, try to interact with consumers. Um, and the idea is to, make sure that you're able to validate some of these ideas that you have um, so that you can test them and then you can kind of use that to inform your final product development. Um, and obviously test and iterate, right? What you learn, try to improve that in your final solution and keep testing it. And always, always, it's very important um, in terms of a lot of critiques of design thinking speak of this is that people reach out like the 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 this five step process right they say it's empathize define and then move on right but that empathy needs to exist throughout it's not something that you do in your research phase and then you go into your little designer hole and then you're like oh i'm going to build things and save the world it's not like that you need to have your stakeholders you need to take your stakeholders along with the process they're also owners of your project right you're not doing it for them the god complex that designers often have uh, we need to break those sort of patterns and take them along, build with them, test with them so that they know that, okay, when I spent an hour with Vaseem and Rishi back in summer, but they're still here building, I know that they're working and something tangible is coming out of it. So keep them in the loop because more often than not, you'll get the best gems of ideas from the people that you're actually designing for. An example that I have here is a little screenshot from this movie that I love. It's called The Founder. It's uh, it's based on the uh, the founder of McDonald's and that story. And this, again, is a great example of prototyping, right? Quick and dirty. They were on a basketball court and they sketched out what this speedy kitchen could be. Uh, again, taking a bunch of chefs in a fast food restaurant, sketching things out like that, making them move, finding the right sort of system, which is now what most fast food restaurants around the world use. So it can start with something small and simple, but don't skip that step. You might be tempted to add a little flair and color and design to it. Maybe some of your prototypes just look good because you have a good hand at it, but don't focus on that because that's not that's not what you're trying to do. Um, so with that, we move into the deliver phase. Obviously, that's where you kind of reel all these ideas in and you build a concrete solution. And you're also obviously um, gathering the necessary feedback. You're also testing it constantly and you're iterating on your product and going back to what I spoke about. 
that the goal is to create something that's desirable to the end user, but also making sure that it's feasible from a technical standpoint to execute and that it's a viable operation, that it fits into what the system that you're creating this solution for is. Um, and with that, we move towards the end of this section, which is really thinking about the mindset that you need when you're solving complexity and you're applying design thinking, right? I spoke about this, but I'm gonna reiterate it. Be empathetic, be collaborative, be optimistic and curious. Take action, embrace diversity. But the most important thing that I think anyone who's been in this field long enough will speak about is embrace the ambiguity. There's gonna be a lot of phases where you might feel like you're sort of going through these sort of scope creeps. You don't know where you're kind of at. You feel lost, you feel overwhelmed. You feel like you spend so much time on a solution, on finding something, but you still don't know anything about the problem. Embrace that because that's what will inform you to make the right choices and move you towards a final solution at the end of the day. Um, I'm going to close with a quote from uh, one of my favorite designers, Natasha Jen, where she speaks about design thinking and how it's not a monster that you unleash on the world, right? Because um, that's like this common sort of way that design thinking has been packaged in recent years, especially after its commercialization as like a viable tool to flip businesses around. Um, and like this sort of five step, two weeks, let me turn your business around using design thinking, um, the design thinking crash course form of thing. That's not what it is. Um, obviously, the core of it is the users, take them along the journey. Uh, understand what the complexity of the issue is and really focus on the problem. Um, be true to the problem, right? Avoid solutioning early on. You have a tendency to do that, park those ideas. Don't dwell on it because more often than not, you tend to find something and then reverse engineer all your research based on that. Break those sort of patterns that you might have and really focus on dissecting the issue, finding that and let the problem take you to the solution and not the other way around. Um, with that, we'll close today's session and I'll leave it open for Q&A, but I want to thank all of y'all uh, for participating. Uh, thank you, Rate UX Gang, for letting us do this and uh, quick uh, shout out to Anna uh, for, you know, all of the coordination and I'll leave it open for Q&As if anyone has any questions, feedback, comments. Thank you so much, Rishi and Watson, for sharing valuable insights as well as presenting case study. It truly has provided a lot of um, really comprehensive and really helpful resources. Um, if you have any questions, please drop in the chat. Um, I, I have a question. So you mentioned the, um, in a, one of the design thinking process where you mentioned in the early on stages that you mentioned, it's really important to interview with stakeholders, audiences, as well as just anybody. Um, I was wondering if you have any like suggestions or like good ways to come up with really like questions that get to the point. Some, some things, like questions that are meaningful and that can actually help in the design planning and process. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, Asim, do you wanna take this or? Yeah, um, yeah, I can start and then you can obviously add on. Mm -hmm. Sure. But that's I think that's a great question. But if you recall, there was a stage before that where we actually defined some of the questions around our problem. Um, and, you know, you need to use those questions to drive your interviews. But at the same time, you're not going to the interview to extract something. You're going to learn something. Think about an interview as you trying to like, um, learn something the other the person's trying to help you rather than you trying to help them see when when you go into an interview with a stakeholder assuming that hey I'm here to help you solve a problem that you have you're gonna fail right you're gonna go and have a conversation with this person in a way that they feel like they are helping you and so start with that mindset and then obviously the more tactical piece about what questions to ask I think having like um, categories of questions is really useful. Um, you might have like 10 questions. Um, what what does this person do? Why why does they do, why do they do this? Whatever it is, try to theme them, like try to make themes, okay? And then when you get into the interview, you're not gonna be able to ask them each question. You're gonna have to just focus on the theme. So, so that's one way that at least has worked for me. 
when you create that interview guide, categorize your questions, make themes, and then just think about the high level objectives. What are you trying to do with this conversation? And then allow those objectives to direct the, drive the conversation. Don't force anything. Mm-hmm. You're not going there to interview somebody as a candidate candidate to get a job, right? You're, like I said, you want to understand their experience and empathize with them. And to do that, you need to go there with a mindset of, you're here to help me. I'm not here to help you. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, but I, yeah. can, I can add to that. Um, um, I also feel like, um, f- I fully agree with what Vaseem said about like the sort of power that exists. And um, letting someone that you're speaking to, um, putting them in a position where they're the ones helping you, you often see people opening up and giving you a lot more than you ask for. Um, so that's a good, great tip that you gave. Additionally, I feel like uh, switching between structured and non-structured is really important. I think your question was very specific to, I would apply that to like a structured interview. Um, but what I would use to inform my structured interviews is a couple of unstructured interviews just around the general premise of where your problem exists, right? If you're talking about uh, technology, like just go speak to your friend about what, how their life is, like how's, you know, what is your phone, exp- anything like that. Just keep it free willing because you can use that to kind of generate questions for your next interview to be structured. Um, and when it comes to the right question, I would say that keep it open-ended, avoid it being too direct and leaning or sort of coercing them in a certain way. Uh, allow them to come and sort of trauma dump <laughs> on you and use the systems of coding and reading between the lines after to make sense of what they said. Because a lot of times the insights, the sort of the juice, the protein of what they have to say isn't in the, them answering your questions. It's in the it's in the middle, right? Uh, you'll notice things like their body language. You'll see their brows tense up. It sounds kind of creepy, but it's very important to observe not just what they're saying, but also look at them um, and like sense the pace in which they're speaking, track their eyes, which is why it's always good to have a couple of people on a call. It can be intimidating, uh, for an interviewee to have like four people asking you questions. Um, but at the same time, it, there's ways that designers can go around it, you know, and just like one person taking the notes, one person's doing the talking, one person's doing the observing. So uh, having those kind of things also help. Uh, but yeah, any other questions? I hope that answers your, it's kind of lo- long one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you for that. I actually have a question that's kind of in a similar vein. Sure. Um, it, can you share a time where you've been in an interview situation and you've had your presumptions challenged or you've come across something that was unexpected and you've had to pivot and what did you do? Absolutely. So um, having your assumptions challenged has happened several times, especially in the last couple of years when we've been doing a lot of service design research. Um, One of them was when I was working on a project around, again, around aging and technology, but this is specific to um, financial technology and banking apps. And um, a lot of the literature, now it's important that a lot of what you're doing with your interviews is you've done a bunch of the desk research that we spoke about, and you're also trying to find like some of that data being corroborated in the conversations, right? So one of the things that I had as data was that, okay, senior adults aren't very good with managing their finances, right? They're scared of technology. They feel like, oh, you know, this is something that's completely off the way I do things. Um, But after speaking to people, it, it came to be that there are certain things that just, it's not them being scared of it. It's just that we as young people look at them not keeping up with digital banking as like a dude, how are you living like this in the past? Whereas for them, it's an absolute choice. They exist in both times. So they're a generation that's not digitally native, but trying to keep up with the time. So it's not like they're, it's affecting their lifestyle in any way because they've lived the life of this. So convenience isn't something that they necessarily chase. And one big sort of takeaway that I got from there is that the human element in banking is why they still go to a bank and prefer that over mobile banking. So that wasn't so much that made me pivot, but it was definitely like an aha moment. 
where we were able to draw that okay digital banking lacks the human the human aspect the human element of it right especially when it comes to money when it comes to senior adults they're dealing with their life savings there's a very personal sort of relationship that seniors have with money which is very different to our generation so yeah that's that's happened it did help me it wasn't so much of a pivot but mostly of like a it really informed my development process from then uh, but yeah thank you so much for that answer i Absolutely. think it's really really important to keep these things in mind and mm -hmm. when you come across them that's only the only time that you uh, become aware of them so right it's really yeah. The yeah. world like, uh, thank you. you need to be open to that I mean as a researcher it's very important to know that whatever you're going in with it it's it's true until it's not right it's one of those things mm -hmm. so you need to keep not get like, you need to not be attached to some of the things that you found out because it's constantly adapting you need to be able to kind of move and sort of be agile with the way you're approaching things and the, the bag that you have but yeah Absolutely agree. Yeah, sure. Do we have any questions from uh, our friends here in the chat? No? It looks like we don't have any other questions. I will allow anyone who might have any last second questions to quickly type them out. But I just wanted to say thank you so much to both of our speakers for putting together such an amazing workshop and for being so mindful and I, it was really great. Thank you so much. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you for having us uh, and, and Kim, thank you everyone for participating today and we had fun. And like I said, just keep some of these things in mind. Um, you can check out their content because the, the presentation will be uploaded. So if there's any resource that y'all need, feel free to reach out to Vaseem and I, we're happy to help y'all. Um, and good luck with this challenge and i hope uh, all of y'all win we're all winners <laughs> all right thank you everybody um and thank you kim anna everybody who's here rishi um it's great meeting y'all and yeah best of luck reach out to us right. if you have any questions sure. yes thank you everybody for joining i'm gonna end the chat soon if there are no questions and thank you rishi and wasim thank you so much and have a good night and a good weekend, everyone. Happy Friday. Cheers. Thanks so much, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.